All right, everyone. Good morning out there in uh, shift land. We are uh, about to kick off today's webinar that will begin in just a couple minutes. My name is Joe McClinsky. Thank you so much for joining us for what is going to be one of my favorite subjects to talk about, innovation. So just sit tight for a second and uh, we're going to get launched here in just a few moments. All right, everyone. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you are uh, calling in from. We are uh, very excited about today's webinar. As I said a couple moments ago, we are going to get started here in just a minute. But appreciate everyone jumping on. Uh, given the fact that you have logged on to today's webinar, I have a sense that you are either interested in the concept of creating a culture of innovation, you're either actively doing this right now in your organization, or this is just something that you think is an interesting topic to think about. Uh, but regardless, we wanna say thank you so much for joining our learning series here where we've done, you know, in our minds, we're trying to figure out what really will resonate and add value to our community. So thank you so much for that. And we will get started in 30 seconds. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and one more time, good evening out there, everyone. My name is Joe McClinsky. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar on creating a culture of innovation. We, over the last several years, have really tried our very best to put our ears to the marketplace, to really be a great listener, and to really try to understand as the world continues to unfold around us. And all of these new interesting corners of uh, kind of these pathways that organizations are taking to not only grow regardless, as we wrote about six years ago, but really thinking about how innovation happens in their organization. And I think today what you're going to have the opportunity to hear is a bit of our experience over the last 18 years, but also for me personally, this is my favorite, first favorite subject uh, as it relates to business for a lot of reasons. I mean, I personally love to innovate and think about new ideas, but I also think, you know, for some of the real smart scientists that I've had a chance to spend some time with over the last few years, with all of the advancements in technology, putting people on the moon and Mars and everything in between, there is still a sense that we don't understand our imagination like the way we could or the way we should. And so the idea that our imagination is this final frontier and that we're really thinking about how to unlock that imagination, what could it do to the discretionary effort of your organization? How could it help you think about outsmarting the competition even more? So if you joined us for today's conversation, again, thank you so much for playing a part and participating. Also, I would say that as you know, this is going to be a full contact webinar. We're gonna start off today actually with a little question because you know, as we think about innovation here, you know, there's, you know, for us, this is no longer a latent thing that, you know, if you're not a tech company or you're not solving the world's biggest problems necessarily, you look at your organization as maybe more of a traditional or legacy type of business. You know, in years past, innovation could be held for other folks. But when you think about the way history has a tendency to repeat, it's been about 10 years since our last recession. And so let's start off with a quick poll here. For those who are thinking about this next recession, how many people listening today believe that the next recession will hit the US within the next two years? So go ahead and participate. We would love to have an active dialogue today uh, as this poll is out there. Now listen, 
I'm not suggesting it is or it isn't, but we're gonna talk a little bit of data on why we might think this is an important thing to think about. And as it relates to the next recession, we also know that this is an opportunity, truly. I mean, some of the, the greatest organizations have emerged from whether a depression or a recession. This could be everyone from GE, IBM, Disney, Apple, and even Microsoft. Uh, all had a, a birth, a start after a depression and a recession. So no, this is not going to be a fear-mongering or negative type of thing. But as we close the poll up, we can see here there's about 32% of you that think there is not a recession looming, and about 68% of those who believe it is. And so I appreciate everyone's participation. But so let's look at why, why did we say what we said? Like what was, the, what was the rationale? Well, the first rationale is that the U.S. yield curve is now inverted. Um, you know, before every one of the recessions since 1955, with the exception of twice. And so this is one of the leading indicators that some of our economists, if you will, think about and look at as it relates to trying to predict the next recession. But beyond that, you're also taking a look at kind of what's happening internationally with real estate. And in Australia right now, this was a recent article that I pulled out about two weeks ago, you know, they're finding that the real estate market is actually falling faster than it did in 2008. And so again, I'm not here to tell you that there's another recession necessarily coming. I just, I do think as it relates to, you know, growing your organization, evolving or innovating, or frankly going away, that this is something that if you're on today's webinar and this training series, you're interested in how to play a part in progress. You're interested in how to get your organization to think differently. Now, what you'll see here is that there are a lot of organizations also thinking about this, everything from, under Armour here locally in Baltimore to restructuring and thinking about how do they continue to grow revenue, reduce expenses, and innovate at the same time, all the way down to Wells Fargo. And, and Verizon has laid off a quarter of their work workforce in the last six months because everyone's trying to think about what do we do to prepare for this next correction? Now, here's the problem with predictions. As much as all of this sounds good, we are still just the frog in the water where the temperature is being turned up or, or a better analogy that I like and I've heard before, which is you can't read the label on the jar that you're in. And I'll say that again, you can't read the label on the jar that you're in. And I'll prove it to you with a little bit of interesting uh, visuals and a couple examples here. So since Easter just wrapped up here in if that's something that you celebrate, you can see on the left side of the screen, we have uh, Fifth Avenue in New York City. And in year 1900, you probably can't see it, but there is one car and the rest are horse and carriages or horse and buggies, however you'd like to think about that. And just 13 years later, if you were to poll all the folks living in New York City at the time in 1900, would they see in 13 years, just the mere 13 years later, all of these cars that you can see depicted here, no, my, my guess is they, they wouldn't necessarily feel that way. And in fact, you know, you can see this picture here it has now it's filled with cars as opposed to horse and buggies, and there's only one horse and buggy. Now, the issue is, is again, we as human beings, we tend to uh, not guess uh, or predict things well. I mean, here's Henry Ford's lawyer who said, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty or a fad. Albert Einstein, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. He was grossly wrong there. Bill Gates, no one will ever need more than 60 600 gigs, uh, I'm saying that wrong, kilobytes of memory for a personal computer, uh, which is obviously also wrong. And then Steve Ballmer, not to keep uh, hitting Microsoft here, but uh, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. And in 1899, the guy who ran the US Patent Office said famously, everything that can be invented has been invented. So if you think about these quotes for a second, it sort of leads me to this next example, which is this number 44. So last year I had a chance to, to do a, uh, a training session on innovation. And one of the, 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 the ways that we started this conversation was by putting up the, the number 44. So just as I ask a question here, you can put it in the chat, but does anybody have a, a significance of what the number 44 might mean? I'd be really impressed if someone got this. 
it would be book worthy if you're able to pull this off i will send you a copy of our book any book really for that matter all right no takers well 44 is the number of people that died uh, in plane crashes in 2017. Now in 2018, there was a, a quite a big uptick, but what I would say is if you follow human behavior, and we've done this now for quite a bit of time here, is that we're rational beings. We don't necessarily look at the data in a way that does inform our decisions in a seamless way, right? We, we try to think digitally with zeros and ones and calculate risk, but at the end of the day, we're more analog, we're more like mother nature, this continuous stream of thoughts where we kind of go from one side to the other, not trying to eat, be eaten by the bear. Now, even though there was only 44 people that died in 2017, this number represents probably something you've heard before, but there are more than 40,000 people every year in the United States who die fatally um, of a car accident in some way, shape, or form. But if you had to ask the question, how many people are really scared when you drove to work this morning or when you drive home later today, the answer tends to be, not that many of us. In fact, what we tend to feel at this point is that we are frankly just comfortable with what we know. And so I want you to think about just writing down the word certainty. Certainty is how we as human beings make sense of the universe. It's how we make sense of our world. And that certainty is directly impacted by this particular topic. The, it's called the availability heuristic. It basically means that we're all that pink or red dot, depending on the hue of your computer screen today, and all of the information we use to make a decision either just happened to us, it was extreme, it was vivid, it was negative, it was primary, all of these things that psychology has been studying now for about 30 to 40 years about how we make information. But the problem is, you know, we're all living in a bubble. We're all living in a point of view that really is limited to the information around us. And what we don't know is whether that information is in fact correct. And, and you know, if you follow again, kind of some of the work of Danny Kahneman, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, he talked about system one and system two thinking, and really, I think, made the conversation about how we all have patterns of thinking. We all have shortcuts, ways that we operate the world, and we have bias. And you could take this heuristic into a bias, which is, you know, this is our availability bias that most of us on today's, you know, conversation and training today, we're all operating from only what we've heard, what we've learned, what we've seen, what we think we know. So how could you possibly know what else is happening in the world? Well, the good news for us is, you know, over the last 18 years, we've worked with more than 600 plus organizations, tens of thousands of leaders, hundreds of thousands of employees. We've actually collected more than a million data points through our surveys to learn. Like what are some of the most common concerns that organizations are thinking about or business leaders? And what we keep coming back to that we hear as a common concern is that people are trying to figure out how do we get our team to get it, get what's coming around the corner, get the fact that we all have to put a little extra in, get the fact that all of us need to be all in in order for our organization to be successful. Now, I don't know if you can relate, but, but to me, from an innovation perspective, when I think about some of the most common challenges with innovation, I would love to hear from you all. So in the chat feature, just go ahead and throw out, what are some of the biggest concerns and challenges that you guys see from an innovation point of view? That's great. Awesome. And so what we've spent a lot of our time doing, this is the shift team here in action and in at work, is you know, we have a team, a collective, if you will, of about 30 folks within our organization who are constantly thinking about these things. And we've been recognized as the best place to work eight times now out of the last 10 years. We just were actually ranked nationally with our uh, venture capital accelerator, which we'll talk a little bit about here. And so innovation is core to who we are. In fact, one of my partners here at Shift, his name is Chris Steer, he has a term of art that I'll let you guys use called permanent beta, is that we're always learning. We're always listening for that next thing. So if you've kind of heard this and said, okay, well, all this sounds great, but what, what are we gonna, how are we gonna think about innovation? And so um, I have been uh, fortunate to surround myself with not just an amazing team here at Shift, you know, but I've had the chance to, to meet several CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. I've had a chance to sit down with 
you know, the likes of Richard Branson a few times at his island. And I happened to come across a gentleman by the name of Roger Hamilton, one of these trips. And he has a, such an interesting way of unpacking what's happening in the world. And so I, I saw this and I thought it would be useful to share it, which is, you know, as he's thinking about the next recession, he's got these sort of three topics that he's considering, which is everybody wants to be the next Uber um, or the next Facebook or the next Google. But if you're an organization, it's time to be a, a zebra, not a unicorn, right? This is not about aiming for a billion dollar valuation. This is about really thinking about cutting costs, cash is king, and focusing on repeat revenue and some of your best customers. But at the same time, you can't put your head in the sand. I love what he talks about here is thinking globally and acting locally. You know, in this coming downturn, you know, not just currency risk, but also thinking about how we can all digitally transform our business and not let proximity be an inhibitor. And then again, you know, coming the riding wave here, I mean, there are so many things to be excited about as it relates to, you know, data is the new oil or how AI is going to continue to help shape the way that we think about business and our lives in general. And so I thought this was kind of a nice little neat kind of hit the pause button for a second here and think to ourselves, gosh, you know, like if we thought to ourselves, if you're a business leader on today's webinar, how are you going to think about some of these things as it relates to innovation? Now, I also love this quote, which is, you know, when darkness is at its darkest, a star shines the brightest. And I think this is also something for us to think about as we head into whatever happens in the coming years. I think it's probably in, inarguable, it's undebatable that we're all going to have to think about evolving. Now, whether that's you as a person, this is some of the things that we're going to talk about today. How can you as a person think about innovation just as an individual? But we're also going to talk about the collective, your organization, how to really think about designing a process, an approach, and a strategy that is sustainable. Because we've done this. We've done this for ourselves, which you'll hear a little bit about here in a second. But we've also done this for a lots of organizations over the last 18 years. And what I can tell you is, is that, you know, there are a couple answers that I think we can get to. Now, this gentleman, if you're not familiar with who he is, I would highly encourage you read up on him. His name is Ray Kurzweil. Ray is uh, an inventor and a futurist. Um, he is uh, a graduate of MIT. He's written seven books. But the thing that makes Ray probably the most famous is that back in the 80s, um, he made 140 predictions about the future. Now, Nostradamus... You know, several other people that we might look back to as like, you know, uh, uh, you know, philosophers or, or prophecies, if you will, of what the world might look like. He right now, Ray Kurzweil, is the most accurate futurist in the sense that he's been documented that 86 percent of his predictions have actually come true. Now, there's some debate about the generalities of whether the truth and the facts really you know, have come to bear the way that he has. But what I love about Ray is that it's not guesses. He's actually just applied a framework. So my background's in economics. Um, I love frameworks. I love graphs. I love charts. I love thinking about the relationship between things. And what he did is he took, you know, Gordon Law, um, Gordon Moore, rather, Law, the, the Moore's Law. Some of you may be familiar with that term, which is um, the speed in which computers um, work, frankly, right? So if you thought about the, you know, the Apollo missions back in the 60s, when we were putting people into space, the size of those computers, the, the power of those computers literally are sitting in the palm of all of our hands today in the in the case of our smartphones. When you know these were you know computers the size of rooms back in the day. And so when he looked at Moore's law, he developed what's called the accelerating rate of returns, and he applied this to so many different industries. And I think what's kind of interesting and fascinating about this is Really, the big takeaway for me is that innovation is not linear. Innovation can be exponential. It can be this slope that you see that's ever increasing. And particularly when you think about change, this is the way I would say the roller coaster of change is happening for all of us. And you know, more than that, when you think about what has happened in the last, let's say, 100 years or so, the printing press, the telescope, which is obviously a lot more than 100 years ago, you know, the steam engine, the telegraph, the light bulb, the telephone, the car, man on the moon. Now what you see is, you know, in the last, let's call it the next 10 years, you know, there's going to be more change in the next 10 years than there has been in the last 250 years. So again, I caution you, I challenge you to remove your bias, you know, get out of your available heuristic or your availability bias. Think to yourself, what is the blue dot of information? What are the things that you need to know? And, and I can tell you just, again, personally, 
you know, I've read probably eight to 900 books now on the subject of business, psychology, history, philosophy, science, and art. I think at the end of the day, we're all artists trying to create, you know, and manifest what's in our head, our ideas. And I also believe, you know, you've got to go see where it's happening. I've traveled to Tel, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Israel to see the tech scene there. I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time in Seattle and Silicon Valley. And what we're trying to do here for you all today is to give you a map, to give you a bit of a roadmap of how this might look. Now, the best way to give you that map is to continue to give you some examples. I mean, when you think about the, the astonishing pace of billion dollar companies, the typical Fortune 500 company is sourced by World Economic Forum said it took about 20 years for our typical Fortune 500 to get to a place that it was a billion dollar valuation. But then came Google and Facebook and Tesla and Uber and Airbnb. And then if you really want a great book, check out Kai Fu Lee's book around AI superpowers. He does an amazing job of talking about what's happening in China, what's happening in the United States, and how things are just going to keep going faster and faster and faster. Now, change is inevitable, as we can see, but what I think is an interesting distinction is that progress is not. And so what we will learn today, I hope that you'll glean from this, is that some of the things that are holding you back from progress is what we're gonna call innovation theater. Now this is a, a topic that's been written a lot about, but when I think about theater, I think about my mom. She was an aspiring actress. Um, she was in a few um, movies as an extra. I remember being you know, eight years old, reading lines with her um, in our living room and, and learning what theater was, which is it's drama, it's pretending. You know, It's pretending to be something that you're not. And innovation theater is very similar to that. It's this idea that you, you sort of, and we'll talk, break down some of these things, but you know, innovation is not an act, it's a continuous effort. It's, you know, it's kind of the difference between you know, most of our computers as invented by a guy named Alan Turing back in the, the 30s and 40s are done digitally with zeros and ones. Most of us who understand that will get that. But when you think about the way the world happens, mother nature is not digital, mother nature is analog. It's this constant and consistent stream of thoughts, of ideas, of movements, of actions, of learnings, of adjustments, of course corrections. And it doesn't stop, it's back to that concept of permanent beta. So when you think about an organization, we've gotta figure out what's the anatomy, what's the DNA of an organization that sort of adds to this innovation theater. So maybe this is something you can relate to. And if so, I would ask that you sort of maybe just chime in in the chat feature here. You know, can anyone relate to you know, not being able to come up with ideas because you have a hard time implementing them. You know, companies launch innovation challenges to collect ideas, but don't dedicate the time and resources enough to preview and prioritize. Then you've got open innovation platforms that, you know, might collect things. There's a really great uh, software application that I know one of our participants today um, is a partner of in Bright Idea. It's this massive enterprise way of thinking about categorizing and organizing an architecture to creating new ideas. But but again, the technology itself alone will not fix this. And then there's organizations that hire a chief innovation officer. And again, this is you know, not a bad thing necessarily, but you know, it's like putting innovation on a person as opposed to the organization. What we wanna talk about today is how do you create a culture of innovation? You know, we talked about this new technology feature, you know, this idea that innovation labs, again, you know, giving things a new name like a hackathon or just using innovation to describe anything. These are examples of innovation theater. What we're talking about is having an innovation mindset. And so I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with innovation. I mean, again, it's almost like knowing someone who after New Year's Eve sets a resolution to just lose weight, get healthy, and, and you see them posting on Facebook that they're going to the gym, but you know that they're not really going to the gym or you know that they're not really putting in the work. And then once January is up, they stop posting because they stop doing it. So instead of thinking about a system or a process or a practice, it starts with mindset. And as I asked you to write down earlier the word certainty, the innovation mindset, as you hear the police car riding past us here today, starts with understanding uncertainty is actually the key defining feature of innovation. When we've unpacked all of the organizations that we've worked with that we, we really do believe are innovative. I mean, everything from the, the disciplines of lean or agile or thinking about you know, other ones like, uh, uh, you know, design thinking and IDEO and some of the amazing work that they've done, it is a mindset first. And that mindset is something that you've got to think about what is the psychology and the approach to innovation. 
You know, what's the best way to manage this uncertainty? Because in an organization, it's usually about risk and reward, right? And so a good innovation process should allow teams to change directions based on learnings and stop a project if necessary without negative consequences. But when you look at the incentive structure in an organization, it tends to be based on two things. Based on who knows what, a knowing culture, not an understanding culture, not a, a culture of curiosity, not a culture of understanding, but a culture of knowing. And then all of a sudden that becomes really, really important and it's what we incent. Or a culture of winning, culture of achievement, a culture of high performance, which we love. But again, there's multiple sides to this truth. There's gotta be a way that we think about this idea of innovation that we're rewarding failure and learning. We're rewarding what we maybe have gone through to put us into a different point of view. So that's what we're really gonna break down here. And part of this comes from my main man, Mr. John Cotter. I think he's one of the most underrated thinkers as it relates to management theory and organizational development. He back in 2007 and eight had a great book called Leading Change. And what he did is he broke the organization down into two different easy to think about frameworks. On the left is how we thought about innovation, that it's linear, it's a static sprint, it's about the customer voice, it's about having a skunk works team or creating an idea or, you know, but, but you know, failing fast is not really gonna get you there. If you want a real culture, what you've gotta think about is what we'll call modern innovation. Think about continuous, as we've talked about analog. Think about not the voice of the customer, but the entire life of the customer. Think about how Amazon has done an amazing job with that. You know, Skunk Works is the idea that innovation is going to happen outside the organization. But what we're talking about is that ideas and generation of initiatives and integration will happen from everywhere. That this is culturally driven, that it's something that we can pivot quick from. And so this is a visual for you on how this would look. Now, having said that, we've got to also just kind of break down innovation into three simple buckets. There's the idea of the ideas, right? These are the things that you know, you're thinking about. And if you're a business leader, if you're a CEO in particular, I was just on the phone yesterday with one of our clients and the CEO went on a rant for at least 12 minutes about how the organization just can't keep up with his ideas. That they've been talking about things for years without seeing them come to fruition. And there is nothing more frustrating than having an idea that doesn't have its day to show up, that doesn't have its day to become a thing. And so what we're gonna talk about just today is really focusing on ideas. Now, once you have an idea, then the question is, what's the proof of concept? How do you take this from an idea to let's test and validate our assumptions? Let's let the market, let's let the data, let's let our employees, let's let the world tell us whether this is a good idea or not. And then let's talk about integration. So for today, we're gonna to just step you through the first phase of this, which is ideas. Otherwise, we'd have you guys here on for you know at least two or three hours. And there could be, if there is enough interest for us to go down the rabbit hole on initiative management and integration process, we will, but it'll be based on you all today. If this is something you wanna hear from, we'll be happy to share it with you. And if you've had enough of us for today and ever, then, then you won't jump on and we'll go from there. So let's unpack this idea process. So the first thing you need to think about is how do we align on what we're trying to do? One of the stated goals we, hear, we have here at Shift is that we wanna go from a company that is today, our management consulting business, is 90% based on service powered by a human being, right? A typical professional service organization and about 10% of our revenue is baked in products. We actually wanna flip that. We want that 90% of our business is based on a product potentially di digitally delivered, not by a human being, and that 10% is based on service. That is the objective. So every good innovation strategy starts with aligning on what are the objectives. And then discussing how do we think about ideas and discussing how do we take those ideas and explore where they should go. Now, if you think about, again, ideas for us, you would, might wanna just also have a more general thought process around ideas, whether it's continuous and dynamic, but this is to give you a head start so that you don't have to start from scratch on exactly what your ideas should be. Now, when you think about where these ideas are coming from, here's a set of about seven questions we believe would be really important for you to think about. So first question, how are ideas generated now and where do they come from? What we find is they typically come from the top of the organization, but that's not always where they're the most successful. What training would our team need to generate ideas? I mean, one of the things I love that we talked about six years ago with Grow Regardless was some of your very best ideas are gonna come from the people who are closest to it. 
In the SEALs, in the Rangers, they call it dynamic subordination, which is not leading the organization from a top-down hierarchical structure, but that whoever's first in the room makes the call, makes the decision, and is in charge. And so could you imagine a day where your organization almost feels like a living organiza organization as opposed to a static triangle? And then managing ideas. Is there an internal way to track ideas across the population? Like, I mean, how many ideas you think happen in your organization throughout the day that you never hear about, that you never see come to life? I mean, I think there's so much untapped potential and imagination sitting inside of organizations, particularly at scale. You know, one of our clients right now is, you know, multi tens of thousands of people, and we are helping them right now really structure in a, in a management process where they can not just have the top 100 people participate, but how about we get the top 500 people to participate in innovation? What would happen then? You know, and then again, what kind of communication loop do we need around these ideas? And then evaluating ideas. You know, what's our point of view? And how do we measure these things? How do we evaluate, evaluate these ideas? This is just the start. Now, for me, when I think about evaluation of ideas, I think about um, a, a person in my life who is, you know, one of my mentors, one of my heroes, and someone I think the world really looks up to is Richard Saul Werman. He is uh, most notably known for as the founder of TED, Technology Entertainment Design. He founded that back in 1984, but he's a topographer by trade. He maps data. He basically unpacks information, and he's written 90, you heard me correctly, 90 books on the subject of understanding on all these different subjects. And you know, he gave me this framework in his last book, Understanding Understanding, which I would highly recommend you go check out. And what he said is, there's really kind of only five ways to think about ideas. You're either adding something, you're filling a need, you're doing the opposite, you're subtracting, or you're creating something brand new like Peter Thiel talked about in Zero to One. And when you think about what TED did to the conference model, it did a couple of things. It, instead of giving the person an hour, it gave them 18 minutes. That was a subtraction. Instead of having someone sit in front of a podium, that was another subtraction. Instead of using PowerPoint, you know, today TEDx is fancy with PowerPoints, but back then that was also a subtraction. So his innovation, strategy and philosophy was literally baked in this simple to think about framework in this acronym that I'm going to step you through here in just a second. So when you think about this, the question framing I would use is how might we? That's a design thinking term. So in this case, how might we add, you know, more jobs or better jobs? And AT&T has invested a billion dollars into retraining its current workforce and to re thinking about how does it get people ready for this digital era? How do we build the competency of digital fitness? And so that's just a simple way to think about how they got to solving a very big problem. As we know, automation is likely to kill somewhere between 30 and 50% of the jobs in retail. And as we think about how do you retrain workers, AT&T is trying to get ahead of the game. But you can also say, how might we fill a need? And what I love about what PwC is doing in this use case is, they're thinking about how do they build an internal digital accelerator to increase their team's digital awareness, proudness, and fitness. They're using this for their clients. They're collecting this data. And again, they can see that, you know, as we all don't want to be the, the, the grandfather or the aunt or the uncle that one of us has that doesn't know how to use the remote control or use their smartphone, but only as a phone, right? I mean, if you feel a little behind because technology is advancing faster than you can keep up or learn, you're not alone. But at the same time, it's only going to get faster. And that's the challenge. You might think about how might we do the opposite. Zappos is amazing at this, right? This, they pay people to quit. Everyone recruits in their organization. They've eliminated commission. These are use cases. These are case studies of how organizations are innovating by simply using this framework of a nose. And then how might we subtract? One of my favorite examples came to me by our partner um, in Shift Ventures, Jeff Cherry, you know, had a contact at Grayston Bakery where this is a company that hires folks coming out of not just incarceration, but also those who are struggling to get into the labor market. Instead of having them fill out an application and seeing their resume and going through an interview process, they have a thought process called open hiring. So instead of using any HR capacity or resource on the front end of the equation to hire people, open hiring is simple. You, you come into the, 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 the facility in Yonkers, New York, and if they have a job open, you get the job. And they put all of their energy on the back end of building a culture that either helps people swim 
or sync very quickly. But again, this is another way to think about innovation as it's happening. And finally, Catalan. You know, our friends up in Boston, these, these folks have a, a, just an amazing way of thinking about categorizing knowledge in an organization. It's one of my favorite things to ask executives. If you're a business leader, I, I would ask you plainly, think about this question. What are the competencies in your organization? What are the real skills? And what are the skills that you're not personally aware of? So if you're in an organization of more than 150 people, you know how this feels. If you're in an organization of three or four or 10,000 or even 100,000, you can get this use case very quickly, which is just because your LinkedIn profile says that you're good in strategic planning or sales doesn't mean you are. Just because your HR file says that you've got good performance in your particular capacity, that might be true, but what if the organization has something it needs to solve? How does it source the right people for the right jobs? Today, we live in a very weird, static environment where people are just kind of stuck in a job, they get hired for a job, they stay in that job, they might raise and be promoted within that same field. But what we're gonna see in the future of work is more mobility. It's more dynamic elements of how an organization is gonna shape and think about its team. And Catalan has an amazing platform of how they're doing this for organizations at scale. Now listen, once you've established this framework, this, this way of thinking about ideation, there are some pathways that you can explore. Now look, I get that this is a lot of information, but if you think about the way in which your organization is doing it today, I challenge you to think about it this way, which is there are four pathways we've seen with great success. And so back 12, 13 years ago, we partnered with an organization that was only 100 people. I mean, a lot of our business in the earlier days was the SMB market. And this was an organization that was highly regulated in the healthcare industry. And we were able to take data from their customers, data from their employees, and turn their organization into a mini accelerator that was able to process ideas and proofs of concept, that was able to manage initiatives. And today they've been recognized as the best place to work nationally. They've, they've grown, if you will, regardless. They've done an amazing job of creating an accelerator inside the organization. Now, if you don't have the chops or the, or the, or the gumption for that inside of your organization, and I do goad you purposely here, then I would say partner with an accelerator. And I'll tell you about one here in a second, but they're everywhere. Techstars, Y Combinator, uh, Shift Ventures, and the Conscious Venture Lab. You'll hear about this in a second. But the accelerator and startup scene is incredibly important. I have learned more in the last five years investing in over 30 companies, millions of dollars, and sitting on that side of the table. I've, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of businesses and applications that have gotten me thinking differently about business and everything in between. Then there's learning building skill stacks, like are you prioritizing skill development as a core initiative? This could be a certification program or capstone projects. How do you think about that as you saw me talk about AT&T and PwC? You can summon it. You can create a summit environment where are you pulling together your top vendors? I mean, even just for a small lunch or a breakfast and ask them, what are they seeing from your other competition? What are they seeing from other clients of theirs that would be useful for you to know? We do this at scale here. Uh, we've actually created a business around it called Shift Society, which I'll share with you in a second. But participating in gathering people together is such an incredibly valuable exercise to hear and see what others are doing to get out of that availability heuristic. And then finally, lead it. You know, have you put your, your stake in the ground in your industry to suggest what you know, Ray Kurzweil moment that you're predicting or that you believe in or that you want to take a stand in? You know, these are the things organizationally to think about. Now look, it's not just enough though to come up with these ideas and these pathways, you're then going to be challenged with how do I do something with this? And, and I'll be the first to say this is not our model. McKinsey has put this out as well as IBM and others to think about how do you think you know, of your existing business and what's strategic, what's revolutionary, what's incremental, what's experimental, what's aspirational. What I will offer to everyone listening to this is that there's a whole nother hour and a half session that we will talk about on how to integrate these initiatives and ideas in your business, depending on what quadrant they fit in. Because as we try to do often here at Shift is it's always about applying the right amount of resources, not too much, not too little. It's like that Goldilocks space in between the exact kind of resource that you need to pull off integrating and executing on innovation effectively because at the end of the day you're trying to create an innovative business model now for us a bit of humble brag moment it's we've created over the last 18 years now not one business and shift consulting at the top 
you know, an award-winning results obsessed management consulting firm, but we've created Shift Society, which is that gathering place that I'll talk to you about here in a second, and Shift Ventures, which is you know our ability to really stay plugged into the startup scene, and Shift Media, giving us the ability to publish you know, really important what we think thought narratives around what is happening to our industry. And the other reason that we decided to do a collective, similar to, you know, if you're familiar with Zingerman's or GE or Virgin, which has 386 companies within their collective, it's that we know that people are going to want to be more mobile. In the management consulting space, you are lucky to have someone stay upwards of two or three years. We want to not only work with our team, but work with our team and then help them find their wildest dreams help support their value system, help put them in a position that they'd want to run a business one day, then we will help them do so. And we have a little bit of precedent set here. And as I talked about Shift Society, you know, we have now done this model for two to three years where we get together a collection of our clients, of corporate executives, of investors, of innovators, of impactors that get together eight to nine times a year locally here in the Mid-Atlantic that are talking about digital transformation, that we take them, as I talked about earlier, to Israel to check out what's happening there in an innovation standpoint, or go to Singularity in Silicon Valley to see what's happening. And what it's done is it's taken that availability heuristic and it's building it for us so that we can see that blue information, that blue circle that's around there. And not just with Shift Society, with also the idea of, you know, our next session, by the way, is uh, May 16th. I'm gonna come back to this at the end of today. Um, but the gentleman that we have coming in is going to talk about artificial intelligence. He's going to talk about, you know, what is happening with digital transformation, Dr. Jack. And so if you have any interest in that, hang tight, because as we wrap up today, I'll give you an opportunity to potentially participate in that session. Then there's Shift Ventures. I mean, recently, just as last week, um, I'm having a bit of, a, of, a, of an amazing personal week. Um, you know, everybody's happy and healthy in, in the McClinsky family, but we also had a really great week professionally and and so beyond giving the whole run-up we were just named uh jeff cherry our partner in shift ventures and the conscious venture lab was named one of the top accelerators in the united states and you know i i say this both yes as a, a humble brag moment but also in just giving you a sense of all you have to do to participate in the startup scene is sponsor a demo day become a mentor to an accelerator we would love to talk to you if you have interest and you have an expertise to help us with our portfolio of companies that are trying to get you know, from early stage to series A and really getting them off the ground into a place that they're going to be successful. We would love your help and your interest in that would be great. And then skill stacks. I mean, we've spent you know, the better part of the last year really asking our team, you know, what do they want more of? And what we keep hearing from our team is they want to learn data. You know, data is the new oil, as they say. It's this this understanding of not just statistical analysis and data science, but data visualization. Like, How do we help move people forward? What's the best way to think about presenting information? And so for us, we've embarked now on a very formalized process at Shift that you will get certified at the end of the year, that you are to choose two skills throughout the year that we will support you to go get outside learning, but then we wanna test you, we wanna certify you, we wanna make sure that we can spread you know, that skill set across our collective. We want to categorize those competencies and learnings. So that it just doesn't become like a, a training exercise, but it becomes a real strategy that if you look back three years from today, we are filling the needs that we believe our clients will have by building it internally first. And I think it's an incredibly important thing to think about as we're all rounding the bend here with innovation. And then finally, as I talk about the idea of, of, of really, <clears throat> you know, putting your stake in the ground. You know, over the last six months, we've partnered with an organization called HR Certification Institute. It's run by one of the most brilliant CEOs I've had a chance to work with, and Amy Dufresne. They are, you know, uh, certifying hundreds, um, literally hundreds of thousands of folks across the world and becoming more strategic advisors to their organization. And so we had the idea of how do we think about the relationship between the CEO and the CFO. It's so tight, so intimate, so connected, it's so aligned, it's a norm. If we want to change the conversation and think about what's happening with, you know, 50% of the American workforce will be not in the current job that they have, and that 50, the other 50% of the workforce will be in the gig status, and that people want more telecommuting, more dynamic, you know, sort of relationship with their employer. They don't want to sit for 50 minutes at a shot commuting one way each and every day. 
So Amy and I would have changed the conversation to help people that are in HR, particularly HR leaders, to have that same level of relationship with their CEO. And we just launched this podcast literally three weeks ago, and we've already had thousands of downloads with very little marketing. You can go check it out at inevitablefutureofwork.com. But for us, this is what innovation is. We're using this as a platform, not to say what we know, but to learn and to understand. And we've interviewed Angela Duckworth and you know Franz Gilbert from Deloitte, who worked with Josh Burson really, really closely, as well as Dave Ulrich, who is the godfather of HR. And these folks have been so graciously and kind enough to give us sort of a front row perspective of how they think about innovation and how it works in their organization. And so these are just a couple examples of how it works. Now, I will begin to land the plane here a bit with the idea of that's what your organization can do, but the question is, what can you do? And so at one of the sessions that I was at about four years ago, three years ago in Silicon Valley, I heard a, a, a woman by the name of Vivian Ming talk about how school, traditional school, our education system does not prepare us for the future. And what she outlined was there is a, a thing called the master doctrine being created by educators, by college professors, by college presidents right now of what, given what we know about AI, given what we know about technology, given what we think we know, not everything, about what's gonna to happen to the workplace. What would be the skills, right? Back in the day, it was be a lawyer, be an accountant, be a doctor, be an engineer. Well, we don't know if those jobs are gonna look the same. In fact, we know that you know, if you were gonna be a radiologist, that, that computers today are predicting with much greater accuracy than any human being ever could. So what's the use case there? What, what's the reason to stay in that, 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 that world? Well, we might have an environment where you have multiple careers. We might extend life where you have you know, many different phases of life. And so the skills that they've all arrived at really map nicely to what we talked about in Shift the Work. It's the idea of creating, what are the priorities in your head and your ability to build your creative muscles. I've recently kind of reignited my passion for art and my daughter is just amazing in this way. She's always been artistic and creative and she's crafty and she has her own art room in our house. And you know, I've spent now the last few Saturdays and will continue to, you know, whether drawing with her with our little Zen tangles, and if you haven't checked that out, Zen tangles are this really cool way to just kind of draw with a friend or with a family member, and it's just a great routine and exercise. Or, or, or paint, or pour paint, or or craft, or or go paint some pottery, or whatever the case is. But how are you building your creative muscle? Are you spending time thinking about what ifs and getting comfortable with uncertainty? That's really what creative is, creativity is to me. Or the idea of feeling passion with your heart and empathy. Like, you know, I, I love the idea of how are you building empathy? And I think the best way to build empathy is, you know, go stay the night in a homeless shelter, which I've done, or go do a police ride along, which sounds a little, you know, social justice warrior, but it is. Like, it, you can have an opinion about what you read in the news, but when's the last time you went frontline and actually had a conversation as opposed to writing a check? Or if you want to understand innovation, go to Israel. I'll hook you up with one of the top influencers in Israel who will help get the guy to navigate you to where you need to go. Or if you want to learn from what a billionaire does, call them up, email them, ask them, find a way to get in front of them, ask, get frontline exposure, become an investigative reporter, learn what it is to sit across from someone and really try to build that empathy gene. And then finally, courage. Look, how do you build courage? You take chances. How do you build courage? You try. It's that Teddy Roosevelt quote. If you don't stand on the sidelines watching it happen, you don't, you don't spectate, you play. And I think so often we forget this in this digital world where you know, we're on Facebook. That's not playing. You know, sure, you might be experimenting and doing some market research, but then at the end of the day, you've got to actually get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves, and make it happen. And so if I were you, I'd think to yourself, on a scale of one to 10, like how good are you at creativity, at empathy, at courage? And think to yourself, what are the couple of things that you can do to build these skill sets even more? Because it's coming. I'm not the only one. We're not the only one saying this at Shift. This was a cover, uh, if I believe, back in 2014, uh, 2012, actually, of Time Magazine, <clears throat> which is predicting that 2045 is the year we become immortal. Just contemplate that for one second. Ray Kurzweil also believes that by the early 2030s, we will have actually cured the disease of aging. So that's maybe good news and bad news for some of us when you think about what age you'll be frozen at for a very extended period of time, if that does in fact come to fruition. But regardless, 
Ladies and gentlemen, there's never been a more exciting time to be around. And I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln, which is the best way to create your future is, or to predict it, is to create it. So this is within our control, because if you think about the rate in which, you know, these are all technologies or companies that came on the scene just 12 years ago. Facebook, Twitter, Airbnb, IBM, iPhone, the Android app. These things have become ubiquitous in just 12 years. Just like that Easter day parade I showed you in the year 1900 when there was all but one car, and yet 13 years later, human behavior, society changed radically. And so I think that's pretty darn exciting. So to wrap things up here, you know, where were you on October 7th, 2018? Chances are you're not gonna remember. But what I will tell you is there was a day when I remember growing up in the 80s, it sounds like forever ago, where when the shuttle was taking off, the world stopped, got in front of its TV, grabbed a bowl of, if I'm not mistaken, peanut butter Captain Crunch, and I got a chance to see the, the, the shuttle go up. And we all thought to ourselves, we are really seekers and explorers of a better truth. And I think one of the things that enamored us with all wanting to be an astronaut is to go explore the unknown, the not certain. And I think that's a really interesting thing. But when you think about the October 17th, 2018, I think we've all become a little numb to, you know, that was the day that SpaceX, Elon Musk, launched the first rocket into space or not first but a rocket into space and this is a picture taken and i didn't watch it i know a lot of people didn't see it like it's now become part of like our daily routines that we're just shooting things up into space and there again and i think that's one of the challenges is how do we stay awake to the amazement and one of the things that i love to do is write letters write letters to my friends my family members but i also like writing letters to myself you know, I've, I'm someone who, you know, experienced a little bit of trauma like we all did growing up. I went to 23 funerals by the time I was 23. And I remember one of the things that I did was I used to write myself a letter when I was 23 after losing my mom, thinking to myself, where do I want to be in three years? Where would I want to see in five years? And so there's this really amazing website that we now wrap a lot of our innovation workshops up with. We ask people to write this futureme.org where you can write yourself a digital letter and you can see you can deliver it to yourself in one year, three years, or however when you want. You can see what letters people are writing if you want to make it public. But the idea that this shows up one day in your inbox, and just as a subtle reminder that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for the progress we've made, but then we sometimes underestimate what can happen over the span of maybe longer than a year, maybe five years or 10 years. I think there's a famous Bill Gates quote that said, we often overestimate what we can do in a year, but we underestimate what we can do in five. And I think that's really true. And I would encourage you to wrap up today, go to that website and check it out. Now, if you need a little extra inspiration, this is a, a really cool story about something that happened about a year ago. I was fortunate enough at a conference called Archangel, hosted by an amazing individual named Gio, who put a bunch of us social entrepreneurs together in a room and one of the gentlemen I met, he just, he just a rock star. This guy named Brett Hagler runs an organization called New Story. This particular video has been seen more than 10 million times now on YouTube because of what it's doing. Think to yourself, how long it takes to build a house today. Think to yourself, the developing countries. And so here you'll see they're building homes now in under 30 days in developing countries. And not just building them. As you see here, they're 3D printing them. And there's one sitting in Austin as we speak. Look at that thing. It's absolutely extraordinary that this is happening. And, and Brett runs a not-for-profit, ladies and gentlemen. This is not out of a tech company. This idea that 3D printing just is one of the technologies that we should be excited about. Printed this home in under, actually I was wrong, under 24 hours. And this might be a way to start solving some of the world's biggest issues. So check out New Story, Brett Hagler, for a really great example of inspiration of what could you and should you be thinking about. So to wrap things up, where what do we read and listen to on the regular to get our information, to get out of our availability bias and heuristic? Well, these are five amazing, uh, if I do say so myself, 38.5, Abundance Insider, Blogs, Farnham Street, Futurism, and the Shift Blog. I would highly encourage you to check those out You know, maybe once a week. <clears throat> Six must-read books. We've talked about a few of these. Uh, Stephen Kotler is one of my favorite, favorite authors, along with Peter Diamandis. Um, there's a great book if you're involved in not-for-profits or fundraising called New Power. Um, Understanding, Understanding, Richard Saul Werman. Reinventing Organizations is an oldie but a goodie. 
read Hoffman's last book, The Alliance, and of course, Shift the Work. And as we round out here, you know, we're big into podcasts because I think this is a new medium that people need to think more about. Sam Harris, The Wall Street Journal, The Future of Everything, our quick 25-minute podcast, radically agile from our friends up at uh, Catalan in Boston. We've launched two podcasts with a lot of really interesting success thus far that I would encourage you to go check out, particularly Inevitable Future of Work. We've got a couple of really exciting interviews coming up. And then from a learning perspective, you know, if you're not taking courses on Udemy, Coursera, TED, Khan Academy, you know, and even MIT, these are free, ladies and gentlemen, free courses at the fingertips of your hand, which is a weird way to say it, but think about it. The idea that all of us can learn whatever we want to learn at this point. I have made it a personal, I'm going to just say it publicly now. I want to become an expert in artificial intelligence. I've spent the last three years reading, talking, interviewing, you know, thinking about it. We're now starting to think about the applications we have here at Shift. I'm helping other organizations think about how AI you know, can help digitally transform their business. Um, and it's something I wanna keep uh, you know, absorbing and learning. So if anyone has a great AI book or a great AI resource, please send it our way because we will gobble it up quick. And so I'll wrap up today by uh, just suggesting that if you happen to find yourself in the Mid-Atlantic area and you have some interest in our gathering, the Shift Society event on May 16th, Instigating Intelligence, you can register now. Um, we will waive the guest fee, uh, limited to the first three registrants. So this is going to be a first come, first serve. If you are in the area, you're a business leader, you've got to be an executive or an entrepreneur. We would love to have you join us. Uh, this next session is not going to be one to miss. Um, if for some reason you're not the first three registrants, uh, the guest fee is 250 bucks. So this is a $250 uh, really cool offer that we wanted to extend to people who are, again, willing to play a part in this conversation and really just be active with us as we think about where to go next. So I hope that you've all enjoyed today's conversation. We're gonna be sending out a survey to get feedback because that feedback will inform our next steps as an organization. We're, as you know, continuing this journey of understanding as things unfold. We're trying to learn, we're trying to listen. And at the end of the day, you know, we wanna find a way to really shift the way people work so that we can transform the way we live. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing day. And don't forget, this is truly one of the greatest times to be born, to be alive. Let's do something that matters. Let's do something that's worth it. And let's go make a difference.